Well, this morning's uh, scripture text comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 25. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to those who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen. Please pause together with me for a moment of quiet prayer as we open our hearts and minds to hearing today's meditation. Amen. This afternoon we're going to be celebrating Confirmation Sunday. It's always a very special time in our church uh, because this is when our, our next generation of members uh, begin their, their lifelong task of being a part of the process of serving God through our local congregation. They take their membership pledges today and officially join the church and they become full members in every sense as a result of that. They've spent the last uh, eight or ten weeks in study of the church's history and beliefs. Some of the basic things out of the Bible have been brought up again, so that it gives them a foundation upon which to build in the months and years to come. And so it seemed to me that uh, this would be a good time this morning to take a few moments to talk about what it means to be a follower of Jesus, which is really what being a part of the church is all about. We're here because we want to follow the example of Jesus. We want to learn about what his teachings were and how we can apply those in our daily lives. And that's what we try to do each and every week is take something out of the scriptures and say, how can I adapt that into the life I'm living right in the here and now? And I think that we can find some of that as we take a look at the life of Jesus in different ways. You know, a lot of times we Christians go through life as though we were wearing some kind of camouflage blending in with all the surroundings of the world around us. While we need to be living in the world out of necessity, because as you know, the utopian model hasn't worked out very well when they've tried that. If we don't stand out in some way so that people can say that individual is a Christian, we really can't make very much of a difference. We need to exhibit the presence of God, the presence of Christ, dwelling in our lives wherever we are, whomever we encounter. They ought to be able to see that presence dwelling within us. But often we just kind of blend in with everybody else so that nobody can tell the difference. Well, since Jesus is to be the model and the example for us to follow, it can be helpful for us to look at some of the qualities that Jesus possessed and consider how we might adapt or adopt those to our own lives and live them out from day to day. Now, as we begin taking a look at that, remember, neither you nor I are Jesus. We are flawed. We are sinful. We are human beings, whereas Jesus was both human and divine and sinless as well. And so we look to Jesus as an example, but we know that we're never going to hit the bullseye 100% when we try to emulate his lifestyle. But it's the goal that we continue to work toward. Wesley's doctrine in the early days of Methodism had to do with something called Christian perfection, and the uh, confirmation class talked about this in one of the weeks that I was teaching the class. Christian perfection is not the state we are in, but instead it is the goal that we seek. So perfection is a goal, not where we are. Maybe not where we'll ever be, but it's what we strive to become. And the higher we set the goal, the higher we set the standard, the more we're going to attain. If we set a very low standard, we're not going to attain that much because that's just too easy. But when we set it higher, we strive harder and maybe we don't make that, but we come up a lot more than we would have if we were looking for something down here. So here are some of the characteristics of Jesus that we can include in our daily lives. 
The first comes from Matthew 11:29. <clears throat> Jesus says, I am gentle and humble in heart. So two qualities that we find in that short verse are gentleness and humility. We can see the example of gentleness in a number of settings. Jesus' encounter with children, for example. Everybody else is trying to shoo him away. Go on, kids, don't bother him. He's busy today. And Jesus gently invited them to come over and spend some time with him so that he might minister to them specifically and that they wouldn't be out on the sidelines somewhere. And so he was gentle with the children. He was gentle with those who were experiencing hardships in their lives, those who had afflictions that he healed. He showed gentleness to them. And in his title of the Good Shepherd, taking care of the flock, maybe giving them a gentle pat on the head every now and then to encourage them. Humility is exemplified in Paul's words in Philippians 2, where he says, Jesus made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. <clears throat> we see humility when Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples in putting others before himself. When he was so tired he didn't want to go on and people came to him, Jesus ministered to them despite the desire that he had for some time to himself. And ultimately we see this humility in the death that he, he experienced upon the cross, which was not only humbling, but humiliating. Gentleness and humility are not signs of weakness, as some might assume. Things like restraint, compassion, patience require a lot of inner strength and a lot of self-assuredness. And so being gentle and kind and humble are not things that make one look like a weak person. Jesus speaks of uh, humility as putting others before the self, viewing others as being equals. He talks about entering a banquet and sitting next to the door rather than placing yourself at the head table because of humility and how the humble, and how humble is it to be born in, of all places, a stable in Bethlehem. Jesus exhibits in his life gentleness and humility in all that he does. Matthew 16, 24 says, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So the theme there for this next characteristic is self-denial. Most advertisements that you see encourage quite the opposite. They tell you that you deserve this luxury item or this vacation spot or something to make you feel or look 10 years younger. You deserve those kinds of things. Well, usually when we do have a concern for someone else, it's uh, that we need, usually when we do have a concern for someone else and contribute to that need in some way, it is usually only after we have satisfied our own wants and desires. We're not too quick to deny ourselves, first of all. But self-denial is, like humility, putting others first, before ourselves. And it's a challenge, particularly in a materialistic society. Sometimes it is those who have the least to give who give the most liberally. We have a little example of that today. Matt, would you show that for us at this time? <coughs> Let me continue on here. That was for Christmas Eve, so you have to come and see that at that time. <coughs> the, the video clip I was going to show you was uh, simply an individual walking into a restaurant and uh, asking some of the patrons who were there if there was something that they could eat and the people ignored them every time he did this. And then they shift to the next scene where they go to the outdoors and an individual gives a, a small pizza to a man sitting on the street, uh, a vagrant. And then this actor comes up and asks if he might have something to eat from the beggar. And while everybody in the restaurant <clears throat> who is paying for their meals provided that at that time, did not provide that for anybody, the beggar on the street gave it to the one who came by. 
Uh, if you'd like to see it, it's on our Facebook page on the, uh, on the internet, and you can take a look at that at your convenience. <clears throat> but what would you do if you were approached in a restaurant by somebody who is hungry? What would Jesus do? The next one that we have comes from John 13, 34. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men are known for, for my disciples, if you love one another. What does it mean to love someone? It means accepting them. It means caring about them, offering help to them, listening to them, sharing life experiences together. As with humility, it requires putting others before self, a recurring theme here. In addition to this teaching here to love one another, Jesus also taught us to love your neighbor. And he goes even further than that by saying, love your enemy. Love means wanting what is right and good for others. Even if you don't like someone, you can still, with God's help, carry out those expressions of love and concern for other persons. Jesus probably didn't much like the scribes and the Pharisees, but he exhibited love in wanting not to destroy them, but instead to bring them to an understanding of God's love and purpose, which they so desperately lacked. Love is truly very emblematic of the Christian faith. John 15.10 has our next one. It says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. So the quality of life that we see in Jesus here is obedience. In this verse from John's Gospel, Jesus sets himself up as an example of being obedient to God's will. For most of us, obedience is okay as long as it fits in with our own thoughts, our own plans, our own hopes, our own wishes. When the obedience calls us to make harder choices, we become very proficient at things like rationalizing or we buy into some alternative theology which we're more comfortable with at the time. Obedience doesn't, need, doesn't tend to come naturally to us. We tend to test the limits. We tend to compromise. We tend to ignore inconvenient truths. But Jesus promises the reward of being in his presence when we are faithful and obedient to him. Colossians chapter 3 has our next one. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So forgiveness is the next quality of Jesus we need to include in our lives. You've heard it said, and maybe you've said it yourself, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. If you've ever said that, you haven't really forgiven because you're still hanging on to something there that you're not quite ready to let go. To truly forgive means to put it aside, put it away, and leave it there, not bringing it back up again. It's not always instantaneous, but instead it is a process that can take time and intention. Jesus talked with his disciples about forgiveness. And the, Jew, the Jewish rule at that time was to forgive once, and if somebody did you wrong, to forgive them again. But that was as far as it went. With the disciples, Peter says, well, how about if I forgive them seven times? I'll take what they prescribe, they'll add one more, and then I'll double it. And Jesus says, not even seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, as many times as it takes, we need to be ready for, to forgive those who have wronged us in some way or another. Jesus provides the ultimate example of forgiveness upon the cross when he prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <clears throat> they were putting Jesus to death in a most horrific fashion, and yet he forgave. To be like Jesus is to forgive. 1 John chapter 3 has the next one. Everyone who has this hope in Christ purifies himself just as Christ is pure. Being pure in motive, in thoughts, in practices is a very challenging thing. 
Every day, I probably wash my hands 12 times or more. And yet, I have to continue washing them because they're always getting dirty again and again. I get them dirty when I'm working around something that's greasy or dirty or oily. I grab a hold of a doorknob that somebody has had a hold of that uh, sneezed before they opened that, and so I need to be concerned about it. I pick up trash out of the yard that's been who knows where and in whose presence, and I can't keep my hands clean. And so I gotta wash them again and again and again and purify them. And it's just like that with my life as well. I'll pray for forgiveness, and I'll ask God to help me lead a godly life, and before the day's out, I'm standing in the need of prayer all over again. As I mentioned earlier, it may not be easily attainable for us, but it's the goal. And thankfully, we need not be perfect, because through faith in the one who is perfect, Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are made acceptable before God deficient as we are. Becoming like Jesus is a lifelong, progressive process. Confirmation is one step in that, as is baptism, making a commitment of our lives to the Lord, receiving communion, studying scripture, worshiping and serving in various ways. Motorcyclists like to say, it's not about the destination, it's about the ride. Wherever your travels happen to take you, there are interesting things to see, there are adventures, there are people to meet, there are things to learn. And it should be like that in the Christian life as well. The destination may be the heavenly kingdom, but the ride getting there can be really special as well. With learning, with adventure, with people to meet, places to go, things to do, new ways to serve. I hope you'll come and join us this afternoon as eight youth from our youth fellowship take the pledges of membership as they continue through their journey of life and we reminded, we're reminded of the journey of our own as we seek to become more like the example of Jesus. In every way, so little time he took for himself, he was more concerned.